march, let us do so by singing our praises to God, that we have come into this house to give him praise. We have come into this house to give him praise. Praise to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Bless his holy name. Let us now worship God. Join in our traditional AME call to worship. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. For a day of thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. Lord, I have loved thy habitation, the place where thy honor dwelleth. For the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth sing praises. Amen. Our opening prayer and the reading of our gospel lesson this morning will be led by the Reverend Calvin D. Montgomery. All hearts and minds are clear. Let us go before God. Divine Master, Creator of heaven and earth, what a divine privilege it is that you be our God and we be your people. Lord God, we ask for forgiveness of sins, sins committed willfully and unwillfully, O oh Lord. We ask that you create in us a clean heart and renew the right spirit inside us. Wash us clean with the precious blood of the dear Lamb, Jesus. We have faith to know you've done so. We come boldly before your throne. The third Sunday in Lent. Asking that you come into this place. Come into this place, Lord God, that your will be done. And you take divine order over this service. Lord God, we ask now that you instruct your angels to come in and take their places. Bless us all, Lord God, from the crown of our heads to the sole of our feet, that we steady our souls, Lord God, for worship, that you bestow upon us an anointing, an anointing to receive what thus said the Lord God on this day. 
Father God, our spirit bears witness of a divine paradigm shift. Lord God, new doors beginning to open up. But Lord God, the seasons are beginning to change. But Lord God, in Hebrews, it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Lord God, so we want to thank you for Christ. Bless us, Father, on this day to have spiritual attentive ears to receive a mighty word from this, your pastor. A word, Lord God, that will define all odds. And that will change lives and show forth miracles to a dark world. Oh, Heavenly Father, Divine Master, just thank you for being God all by yourself. Lord God, for you said that renewed grace and mercy that will come before us daily and a fresh anointing. For we know your presence is in this place. And we just want to say thank you for coming to sup with us. But Lord God, we ask God to tarry with us throughout our work week. And wherever we are, God, we need your love, we need your power. We just want to say thank you. These prayers we ask now in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. scripture lesson, John chapter 2, verse 13 through 22, and I will be reading from the Revised Standard Version. The Bible denotes, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers at their business. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all with the sheep and the oxen out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who were selling the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal for thy house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign have you to show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen, raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. God's word for God's people. Amen. We will have now a musical selection from Brother Jonathan Knoll. <laughs>
Let the church say amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Knoll, Sister Richardson, amen. and singers for that wonderful selection that God is indeed preparing us. And that's what Lent is, the time of preparation as we journey with Jesus to Calvary, knowing that it is there that the victory will be won and that we will be cleansed from our sins. It is a joy to be broadcasting once again from the sanctuary of St. John AME Church. And we are grateful to each and every one of you who have tuned in with us today on our conference call line or on Facebook Live and later today on YouTube. Be sure to uh, like us and to follow us on Facebook or to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to say hello to us on the chat. I'd like to turn your attention to our gospel lesson that Reverend Montgomery read a few moments ago from John, the second chapter, verses 13 through 22. And while we'll look at the entirety of the text, I ask that you would pay particularly close attention to verse 16. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. I'd like for you to think with me and pray with me this morning, Christian friends, on the theme relevant to our subject matter taken directly from that verse. Take these things away. Let us pray. Lord, speak to me that I may speak in living echoes of thy tone. As thou hast sought, so let me see. Thine erring children, lost and lone. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Now by my own admission, I'm not what one would call a neat freak. I can back that up by commending you to my wife or my mother, and they will tell you the same thing. And even though I wouldn't categorize myself as being a neat freak, I do not like clutter and junk. Now, it doesn't mean that at times there's clutter and junk around me, especially when you have three children in the house. Am I right about it? And even though I find myself at times surrounded by clutter and, and junk, I still don't like it. You can look at either of my offices at this very minute, right here at St. John or up on Wade Park at Greater Avery, and you will see my desk is in order, my books are in order, and there's no junk in my office. Those of you who've been there can say amen. amen. Look around the sanctuaries of, of St. John and Greater Avery, and, and you'll notice very few things out of place. I thank God that that even during this time of pandemic that both of the custodians and building managers at both churches are still on duty and the house of the Lord, even though you don't see the rest of it, is still in order. Amen. See, I often joke with some of my officers, and when they hear me say this, they'll know what I'm talking about, that at times my OCD, my uh, obsessive compulsive disorder tendencies kick in. Am I right about it? This is especially true since we've been broadcasting the, the worship services over the internet. You're not here before we, we come on live, but, but we're busy positioning the cameras at, and making sure that there's nothing in the shot that would be out of place. Why? Because we don't want anything distracting the viewer from what they've come here to see, and that is the cross of Jesus Christ. See, I don't want people to look at this chancel area and, and see a mess. I don't want them to look and see books stacked up behind me and cords and, and wires dangling. I don't want to see papers lying on the street, uh, on the seats or on the floor. In fact, you don't even see anybody behind us in the pulpit. Why is that, Pastor Curtis? Because distractions, clutter, things out of place take the focus off of Jesus. See, in the spirit of Jesus, 
I found myself surveying the length and the breadth of churches and, and telling our officers, take these things away. In other words, get this junk out of here. Amen. Because to paraphrase Jesus in the text, you shall not make my father's house a house of junk. Amen, Amen. Pastor Curtis. Amen. See, one of the greatest blessings God has given to churches is a dumpster. Somebody needs to type that in the chat. The point being that God's house must be represented and thereby kept in a way that honors God. Now, while it's not difficult to purge God's house from physical clatter and junk, clutter and junk, the reality is spiritual contamination also defiles God's house. Right. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, there's certain ideologies, certain philosophies, certain theologies, certain belief systems, certain practices in the church that have nothing to do with the advancing of the cause of Jesus Christ in the world. And these two must be taken away. In today's gospel lesson, we see one of the more colorful incidents in Jesus' life and earthly ministry. The one where he cleanses the temple. The Bible scholars listening to this today will attest to the fact that this is one of only a few stories that appear in some form or fashion in all four of the Gospels. The temple incident in the Gospel of John is set in a different location when compared to the Synoptic Gospels. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the temple scene follows Jesus' entry into the city of Jerusalem. However, in the Gospel of John, Jesus cleanses the temple immediately after his first sign, the wedding at Cana, where he turned water into wine. That being said, it's useful for us today to look at the historical context in which this incident took place. Because in Jesus' day, the people were extremely impressed with the physical temple. It was a grand edifice built by skilled artisans. The temple represented the best of the Jewish religion, and it was a place of unity amongst the people. In Jesus' day, when you traveled to the temple, when you laid eyes on the temple, you were looking at a monument of the Jewish faith. Keeping that in mind, church, at the time of Passover, devout Jews journeyed to Jerusalem where they would go to the temple. And guess who one of those devout Jews was? You guessed it, Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. Look at the text, verses 13 through 15. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers at their business and making a whip of cords he drove them all with the sheep and oxen out of the temple. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Now, in the text, Jesus is clearly upset. There's an element of defilement in his father's house that he is compelled to address in a not-so-subtle way. Now, quite frankly, church, many Christians are uncomfortable with the imagery presented in this text. They're uncomfortable with an angry Jesus. They're uncomfortable and unsettled by an image of Jesus who, who demonstrates violent tendencies in the text as he made a whip out of cords and became a physical deterrent to the injustice that he witnessed in his father's house. But the truth of the matter is, church, we cannot always be nice. Am I right about it? Amen. Why is that? 
because the enemy is not always nice. And Jesus shows us in the text that sometimes you have to handle a situation in a way that everybody will understand. Now you may hear that and say, well, well, Pastor Curtis, didn't Jesus say turn the other cheek? Yes, he did. And you're right. But he never said that we ought to coddle and play with sin and injustice. There are some things that you have to physically pick up and throw out. And in the text, it says that Jesus made his point. He made a whip of cords and he drove the crooks from the temple. But read the text carefully. It never says that he hit them. He hit at them. He made his point. But there is no evidence in the text uh, that Jesus committed physical assault. But Jesus addresses the way in which people ought to conduct themselves and must conduct themselves in God's house. We don't enter into God's house any old way. One of the biggest lies told in the church is that everybody is welcome here. Well, I've come here today to tell you that if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, if you're not washed in the blood of Jesus, if you're not trying to go on to perfection, then you need to stay outside till you get yourself together and then you can come into the house. See, we put up with too much foolishness in the church. Folks bringing the devil and, and the world into the church. You can keep that outside. We'll pray for you. And when you get your head right and your heart right, then you come into the house. Right. Moses was such that he took his shoes off because he was standing on holy ground. In Jesus' mind, the temple was not the local open air market. And while it was perfectly normal in Jesus' day to see commerce conducted in the temple, Jesus was especially annoyed by the level of commercialism he witnessed. So he made a whip out of cords, and he drove the merchants and the animals out of his father's house and went so far as to overturn the tables where money was exchanged. He threw the pigeons out as well. And he threw the people who sold them out. And he said, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. Now, no doubt, this disturbance caught everybody's attention, including Jesus' disciples. Look at verse 17 of the text. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for thy house will consume me. His disciples went through their, their mental footnotes and, and they remembered Psalm 69, 9. And the context of, of verse 17 is Psalm 69, 9. Because if you read Psalm 69, you will quickly learn that it is a psalm of lament. It is a heartfelt cry to God on the part of the psalmist who found himself in a bad place. At this time in his life, the psalmist was being ridiculed on the account of his faith. Therefore, the original context of John 2, 17 is someone who is zealous for the house of God, but who is suffering because of his enthusiasm. In the text, Jesus was zealous for the house of the Lord. And as we will see throughout the Gospel of John, he will eventually suffer, bleed, and die because of his zeal as he pays the ultimate price for your sin and mine. Now, I wasn't there to see it for myself. There's no video recording of the incident. But I can only imagine that the people's eyes were, were wide open and their jaws dropped to their chest in disbelief as they witnessed Jesus' behavior that day in the temple. And after having taken it all in, verse 18 of the text says, 
The Jews then said to him, What sign have you to show us for doing this? In other words, Jesus, who are you to come in here and disturb our temple? Who are you to come in here and, and drive out the commerce and to drive out the, the money changers and, and the animals? What authority do you stand upon, Jesus? And they asked this question because people don't want anyone disrespecting their house of worship, even if they're disrespecting it themselves. Amen. I just said something right there. Amen. See, Jesus witnessed what he perceived to be conduct that was disrespectful to the sacredness of his father's temple. The Jews who witnessed Jesus driving the merchants and the animals out of the temple thought the same of him. And here's a news flash for you, church. There's nothing worse than a religious conflict because often there is no middle ground. When folks start fighting over religion, there's a winner and there's a loser. There's right and there's wrong. There's consecration and desecration. That's what's playing out in the text. Jesus is mad. The Jews are mad. And after being challenged by their question, Jesus gives them an answer in, in verse 19. He says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. With these words, Jesus is foreshadowing his death and resurrection which speak directly to this holy season of Lent. Here, Jesus takes the focus of the temple away from a brick and mortar structure and identifies his body as the temple. Yeah. And again, Jesus' audience was confused because their focus and their understanding was centered on bricks and mortar. And though it lacked the original splendor of Solomon's temple, Herod's temple that is referred to in the text was quite a sight to behold. It was what the Jews of this era knew given that Solomon's temple was long gone. And seeing this radical rabbi throwing men and beasts out of the temple, turning over tables and completely ignoring the decades of sweat and resources it took to build, replied to Jesus, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days. Typical of John's gospel, we get a theological take to inform us that the temple in question was Jesus' own body. Now picture this church. The very son of the living God was standing right in front of these people but they were far more impressed with brick and mortar than they were with yeah. Jesus. They were not impressed with Jesus' claim. Jesus wasn't referencing the physical building being destroyed and rebuilt in three days. Jesus was well aware that it took 46 years to complete that physical structure. Jesus knew one more thing that brick and mortar could not save them. Right. Jesus knew another thing, that sheep and oxen and pigeons could not save them. You can sacrifice all of those animals, but you will not be saved until the Lamb of God comes to take away the sins of the world. Amen. So what did Jesus do? He drove the merchants and he drove the money changers out, along with the animals. And in so doing, Jesus set the stage whereby he was the priest, the sacrifice, and the temple. Everything that you've marveled at is rolled up in one. I am the priest, I am the lamb, and I am the temple. And when you seek to destroy me, come back in three days because I'm going to raise it up again. And it says in verse 21, but he spoke of the temple of his body. Jesus offered himself up on the cross as a holy and living sacrifice. And at the resurrection, 
the temple, his body was destroyed. Because in verse 22, the text says, when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. So church, Jesus cleansing the temple of over-the-top commerce leads us during Lent to examine the ways in which we ought to purge some things in our lives. There's some stuff inside of us that needs to be tossed out. I'll say amen for you. In the text, Jesus was fighting a justice issue because during Jesus' day, it was perfectly legal and ethical to sell animals for sacrifice outside of the temple because people didn't travel with that stuff. When they came there to bring their sacrifice, they had to purchase it from somewhere. However, these folks that day had taken it too far. They had crossed certain lines. And therefore, you could not tell that day where the commerce ended and where the worship of God began. To add insult to injury, church, the merchants were ripping people off. Jesus was having none of it. And he said, take these things away. Whenever I read this text, I think about how Jesus would react to North American Christianity. What would Jesus say about the brand of Christianity that we see practiced here in North America? Before the pandemic, the religious fad was to build big box churches, big box auditoriums with, with a praise band in the background and strive to be a mega church. I visited churches that were no more than a huge rectangle with a stage and lights up front. One that I visited went so far as to have a food court in the lobby where congregants could purchase food to eat before and after worship. They had a bookstore and a merchandise shop with mugs and t-shirts and other church-related regalia. You get the point. And I asked myself the question, am I in a church disguised as a mall or in a mall that happens to have a church? <laughs> See, many mega churches here in North America are good at raising money. They're good at building campuses. They're good at marketing products. They're good at hosting conferences. And in a capitalistic economy where religion is often peddled as a commodity, these ministries appear to be successful. The people who run them are often pro prosperous. But be warned today, church, religion is not a commodity. Right. We're not here to sell anything. Freely we've received and freely we give. Yes, it takes resources in order to maintain our institutions, but we are not here to prey on those who are vulnerable. We're here to pray for and to work for the least and the lost. See, Jesus, newsflash, requires more of us than to just be successful in our ministry. If you're called to ministry, whether as a clergy person or a lay person, Jesus has not called you simply to be successful. And we can stand here all day and debate as to what defines success. More than success is defined, more, more often, success is defined by human standards. Jesus does not call us to be successful, but he does call us to be faithful. Somebody say faithful. In one of the least profound statements you'll ever hear, I'll say this. We must have faith in order to be faithful. You may say, well, pastor, that seems obvious, but you got to have faith if you want to be faithful. We must have faith 
in Jesus Christ who told the astonished witnesses that day at the temple in Jerusalem, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. If you want to be faithful in your ministry where folk are trying to destroy you, when Satan is nipping at your heel, you have to trust in the one who said, if I get destroyed, I'll raise it up again. If I die with Christ, I'll rise with Christ. That goodness and mercy are following me and no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm going to keep on marching by faith. And for our faith to flourish, some things need to be taken away. For our faith to flourish, some distractions need to be removed so that we can focus fully on Jesus. Before me is the altar. And today, being First Sunday, you see the elements for Holy Communion placed on it. And on most Sundays, you see the cross, the candles, and the appropriately colored pyramid covering the altar. But notice, take a good look at it. Notice what you don't see. You don't see books. You don't see papers or anything else on the Lord's table. I've been to churches where I've seen the choir director put the music on the altar and direct the choir. You can best believe I wasn't pastor in that church. I recall a time when a bishop placed his glasses on the altar and I picked them up and held them in my hand until the time came when I gave them back to him. Why? Because eyeglasses, even if they're the bishops, That's right. don't belong on the altar. Amen, Pastor Kurtz. Right. Papers on the altar, right. books on the altar, right. eyeglasses on the altar, right. junk on the altar. Right. Take these things right. away. Right. They don't belong there. Because the altar is not a bookshelf. The altar is not a music stand. The altar is not a place for us to rest our accessories. The altar is a place for us to kneel down and pray. The altar is a place for us to break bread and lift the cup in celebration that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Don't bring any junk to this altar. Amen? Take these things away. Oh, I'm glad, church that Jesus had a theology. Glad that he had a vision for how God's temple ought to look and how we are to conduct ourselves in it. Jesus spoke and he demonstrated with clarity that the temple is not a store, the temple is not a warehouse, the temple is not a restaurant, the temple slash church is a place where we come to worship and to offer ourselves to God. And we worship God with our prayers. We worship God with our praise. We worship God with our proclamation. We worship God with our tithes. We worship God with our offerings. We worship God with our study. And we worship God with our service. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. Oh, Sister Richardson, I wasn't there. But my Holy Ghost imagination tells me that if the song were written, after cleansing the temple, Jesus would have led the people in singing, we have come into this house, gathered in his name, to worship him. We, we have come into this house. Gathered in his name. To worship him. And he would have said it one more time. We have come into this house. Gathered in his name. To worship him. And then he would have said. Just for forget about yourself. And, and concentrate on him. And worship him. Just forget about yourself. Forget about all the nonsense. Forget about all of the turmoil. Forget about all of the mess. Just leave it outside and come into God's house and concentrate on him and worship him. Then he would 
say, just lift up holy hands. Just drop all your burdens. Drop all, all your anger. Drop all your heartache. And just lift up holy hands and, and concentrate on him and worship him. Jesus is clear in the text. Now that we've driven out the crooks, now that we've run away the animals, now that we've thrown out the trash, now that we've eliminated all distractions, we are in a spirit where we can worship God. Church, throw that junk out. Take these things away. Have addition through subtraction. Remove anything that would be a barrier between you and God. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. You shall not make my father's house a house of trade. Thanks be to God. Amen. The doors of the church are open. And if that message touched you, then I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life. Live your life in me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Purge me, Lord. Take the things away out of my life and out of my spirit that would impede me from being in full communion with you. Set my feet on the golden pathway of righteousness as you wash me with your blood and forgive me of my sins. Let today be the day in which I give my life to you, knowing that you love me so much to suffer, bleed, die, and rise again that I might have everlasting life. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, we welcome you into the household of faith. Please write to me at St. John AME Church, 2261 East 40th Street, Cleveland, Ohio, 44103. Please send us an email at St. John AME Church, CLEV, at gmail.com. Or pick up the telephone and call us at area code 216-431-2560. We also offer Greater Avery AME Church to you. You may write us at 7505 Wade Park Avenue, Cleveland, Ohio, 44103. You may email us at greateraveryame at gmail.com. Or you may call us at area code 216 216- Four five nine seven six seven nine. Whichever church you contact, know that the same Savior is in both of them, and we will be more than happy to receive. As persons respond to the invitation, let us now sing, We Have Come Into His House.
giving of your tithes and offerings. We've received several throughout the week. A uh, person's dropping them off or sending them via U.S. mail, and we thank you for that. For those of you who are supporting St. John, God bless you. Please make your check out to St. John AME Church and send it via U.S. mail to 2261 East 40th Street, Cleveland, Ohio, 44103. You may also go to the Givelify digital giving site either through your app or through the digital bulletin or through St. John's website where you can click and give your tithe and offering digitally. Please remember that in addition to our tithes and offerings, we are also asking for a special $100 offering as we move toward Friendship Sunday on March the 21st. So you may pay that today or pay on it as we move toward that day. For those of you supporting Greater Avery, God bless you and thank you. You may make your check out to Greater Avery AME Church and send it via U.S. mail in care of St. John to 2261 East 40th Street, Cleveland, Ohio, 44103. You may also click the hyperlink in your digital bulletin that will take you directly to the Givelify digital giving site where you may give your time and offering. Also, Greater Avery, remember that we too are moving toward Friendship Sunday and that your special offering is, uh, is also able to be given as we move toward March the 21st. So let us now give our tithes and offerings to God. On this first Sunday, we are not able to physically celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion with you, but as is our custom, we will pray a special prayer of spiritual communion, a prayer that is adopted from the Book of Common Prayer from the Anglican Church of South Africa, remembering that we as Methodists have our spiritual heritage rooted in 
the Anglican Church. So as we come today, let us now pray God's blessing. Jesus, may all that is you flow into me. May your body and blood be my food and drink. May your passion and death be my strength and life. Jesus, with you by my side, enough has been, been given. May the shelter I seek be the shadow of your cross. Let me not run from the love which you offer, but hold me safe from the forces of evil. On each of my dying, shed your light and your love. Keep calling to me until the day comes, when with your saints I may praise you forever. Amen. Songwriter says, Glory to his name. We will sing one verse of Down at the Cross. March the 10th at 6.30 p.m. We will have our Lenten worship service and we are uh, grateful to each and every one of you who tune in with us on Wednesday. Next Sunday at 2 o'clock a.m. we will spring forward. So if you tune in late, we will be done by the time you tune in if your clocks are not set. So we will spring forward next week on uh, adding an hour as we move into Eastern Daylight Time. There are several virtual meetings about COVID-19 and the vaccine where you may uh, obtain useful information. Uh, there's a meeting today, 12.30 to 2 on Zoom. The hyperlink is there as well as on next Sunday. Also, the battle for democracy uh, for Greater Cleveland Congregations, Tuesday, March the 9th, and on Thursday, March the 11th. Please uh, share these announcements with others and be sure that you have all of the information you need to make the best decision for you and your family. Let us now close our time of worship.
blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now, henceforth, and forevermore. for being with us today. Have a great rest of your day, a great week. Be sure to tune in with us on Wednesday night at 6.30, and we will see you again next Sunday, 1045, from Greater Avery. God bless you, and have a great day. Bye.